Now in a ray approximation, light travels in straight lines. That's what the ray is indicating. Again, this is quite a good approximation. We know, for example, we can't see around corners because the light that's coming past the corner doesn't do a quick bend and meet us. But we do see instances where this straight line motion changes a bit. Light seems to bend when it goes from one material into another. For example, from air into water. And you might be familiar with looking at a pencil sitting in a glass of water. The pencil looks a bit bent when you see it in the water. That's because the light is bending as it comes from the water into the air. Now, how can we understand that? It actually turns out to be in terms of the different speed that light moves in different materials. Now, we quantify that by a thing we call the refractive index, and that has the symbol n. So we can write down that the speed of a wave v will equal the speed of light in a vacuum, c, divided by this refractive index number, n. We also know that v is always going to be less than or equal to c. Again, it seems in our universe we always travel slower than the speed of light in vacuum. We can rewrite this here to say that the refractive index, n, must equal c divided by v. That is, the refractive index is the ratio of the speed of light in vacuum to the speed of light in that particular material. And we can see here immediately the possible values for n are always going to be larger than or equal to 1. In fact, the refractive index n for vacuum is 1. The refractive index for air is pretty much the same. It's a little bit different, but it's almost exactly 1. The refractive index for water is about 1.3. The refractive index for glass, depending upon the kind of glass, is somewhere between 1.5 and 1.9. Now, something really sparkly that bends light a lot, for example, a diamond, it has a very high refractive index, about 2.5. It's important to remember here that if you have a larger refractive index, that's telling you you've got a slower speed of light in that material. And we'll see now one of the effects that has upon the wave. One of the things that happens when the wave is existing in two materials, and here we've got two materials shown on the screen. I've called them refractive index N1 and refractive index N2. And the one on the left, N1, it looks a bit like air, and the one on the right might be, say, glass or water. So we're going to say here that N1 is a smaller number than N2. That is, that my wave moves faster in the, in the left-hand side of the screen than it does on the right-hand side of the screen. So let's draw a wave here and see what actually happens. Here's a wave that's existing both on the left and the right. Now, because the frequency can't change of this wave, the wavelength must. Now, why can't the frequency change? Well, you can see that if this wave was moving, for example, from left to right, then the same number of waves per second must be happening on both sides. The waves can't sort of be stored somewhere, nor can you get extra waves that you didn't have before. So the frequency stays the same. So we have in this here the same frequency for both waves. So they must have different wavelengths. And that's an important property that will show us why light bends when it changes its speed. So let's use this idea now of the wavelength being different, and we'll see an example. Here's a setup with the same two materials, N1 and N2, and here's our incident light ray coming in, making an angle theta 1 with the normal to that two, the interface between those two surfaces. And what I've drawn on there are these wave fronts here that our ray approximation is approximating. These, these wave fronts here are coming in, and they're nice and evenly spaced. The distance between them is the wavelength. But what happens now at this end, when this wave front is just about to enter into that second material? Well, it's going to have a shorter wavelength or take a bit longer to travel. And so you can see it's kind of bent around so that the faster moving wave in N1 still keeps up with the slower moving part of itself in N2 material. We can see another step when this wave front is still entering the material. Again, it has to go a little bit slower in the material with N2, so it kind of gets bent around a little bit. And we'll go forward now and see the various wave fronts that are now moving in medium with N2. You can see they're closer together than they were in medium N1. It's going slower, therefore the wavelengths are shorter. Now we're going to draw a ray in our ray approximation that's at right angles to those wave fronts. So here it is here. 
That's the ray that will move in material 2. And as you can see, it's not in the same line as we had before. In fact, there's a different angle in here that I will call the refracted angle, theta with a subscript r. And we can see that line is actually bent towards the normal. It hasn't maintained the same angle. It hasn't come straight through. It's come into the material and then bent towards the normal. That's what happens when you go into a slower speed material. You bend towards the normal. If it was the opposite effect, we could draw a similar diagram where you go from a slower to a faster material. It will bend away from the normal. Now, how much does it bend? Well, the geometry can fairly easily show, but we won't do it just now. We'll give the result that you have n1 multiplied by the sine of theta 1 will equal n2 multiplied by the sine of what I've called here theta r, the reflected angle. The refracted angle, I should say. We're calling this bending process, by the way, refraction, a refracted ray as it goes from one medium to the next. And you can see this might be quite useful in manipulating light, having it go from one material to another, where you have some control over those angles. What we're going to see in the next topic is how to use these ideas of reflection and refraction to have devices that can enable us to produce images using mirrors and lenses.